My name is Sandra Martin, and I'm the author of A Good Death. I want to say that a lot of people ask me why I took on such a morbid topic. And I want to say that I don't find it that way, because people are so inspiring. So I found that the way people love each other and support each other, I found it really inspiring. And so I was um, touched, and I was humbled by being able to talk with people about these intimate moments. That doesn't mean they didn't suffer, and some of them suffered horribly. Um, and it didn't make me feel very, very strongly that we need to talk about death. That we seem to have an attitude, it's kind of like the way the Victorians dealt with sex. They knew it happened, but not in public. And they didn't want to talk about it. So we need to talk about that because otherwise there are so many unresolved matters that happen near the end of life. So one of the things that happens with people dying is they put it off. They don't want to think about it because they're scared. There was a time when death was all around us, before antibiotics, before technology, before all sorts of things, before life support. Those things have actually left, often left us in a situation where we're in some sort of technological nightmare, where death is something that we can't accept and we can't have. And so then the big decision becomes, when do we turn off the machinery to let someone die? probably long after that person is ready to die. I mean, this is something I learned when I was writing obituaries. People say, oh, you can't talk to my mother. She'll be too upset. Your mother knows what's happening to her. She's not going to be upset. She's going to want to talk about it. So I, that's what I think. But I did experience lots of terrible deaths, um, mostly in talking with people after them. There's one person I'd like to mention, and that is a woman named Kim Teske. She had inherited the Huntington's gene. Now, when her father died at about the age of 40, he died of cancer. Nobody knew that he was a carrier. And the Huntington's gene carries, it's like the worst. It, it's um, schizophrenia, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. And if your parent is a carrier, there's a 50% chance you're going to get it. So when Kim Teske's father died at the age of 40, he left her mother, 39, a widow with three children, or six children, excuse me, six children. Three of them were carriers, but they didn't know it until the eldest started exhibiting behavioral problems, um, mood disorders, all sorts of things. So he tried to end his life, but he waited too long, and he was no longer capable of doing it. Kim was the middle one. She had no children, and she said, she said to me often, I love me, and I love life, but I don't want to end up like my brother. And so she said, I have a plan. And she, what a lot, a lot of people did before we had a law, they wanted to tell their story. They wanted to know that their life would have some kind of meaning. And if that meant telling their story, and so others would know, and that others would perhaps campaign for a change in the law, then they were prepared to do it. So Kim, I mean, I didn't think she was going to be able to do this. She decided to go without food and drink until she died. I thought... You know, I didn't think she could do it. And I realized that when I was interviewing her, we were going to have to talk to the whole family. So what happened was the whole family got together and they talked about her and they stayed with her. And that meant she became a hero in their eyes. And she actually, it took 12 days, and she did die quite easily. She was supported by her sisters in particular, one of whom was a nurse. So they had all sorts of little tricks as in keeping her mouth swabbed so that you know the thirst wouldn't get too strong. Because of course it's the liquid that is really the issue. It's not the food. So that was one death. But there are other ones. And there are people who think they can end their lives to avoid old age, and they botch it. I mean, there was a story I was told on the condition that I changed their names, and these were a couple. He was a doctor, very much a take charge person, and he was in the quote, self-checkout line. And so, he determined, was his wife. So he had access to pills, he collected the pills, and um, he kept telling his elder son, one Thursday you're going to get a message, and it'll be from the cleaning woman, and it'll be that we have ended our lives. And it was, went on for so long that the son, you know, it sort of had an aura of, of gallows humor. The son finally said, do not do it the third Thursday in September, please. I have a big deal brewing. 
Well, of course, that was the time when the poor cleaning woman arrived to find two ravenous cats and this couple. Now, what had happened was the wife was a tiny little thing, so the husband thought she didn't need much in the way of pills, but she, was, she had chronic pain, so she was addicted to painkillers. So all that happened to her was that she fell out of bed and broke her collarbone. He was comatose, but not dead. So it ended up, he was on life support until the sons finally agreed to pull the plug, and she lasted another two years in one home or another in depression and, and you know, sort of deepening anxiety. That is not the way I want to die, nor is it the way I want anyone I know to die. I want us to talk about it. I want to have the wishes known. I want us to make choices. But to have a choice, you have to take responsibility. And that's my message. Before we had a law, and of course the law needs a lot of work in my view, but I can talk about that if you like. Um, yes, you could, suicide was no longer a crime after 1972. And the thinking was, if a person is dead, there's no point in charging them <laughs> with a crime because, and if a person fails to commit suicide, then that person needs treatment, not punishment. But assisting a suicide was still against the law. And it continues to be against the law. Aiding and abetting a person to kill himself or herself is against the law. And so it should be. It has to be the person's choice. So I did talk to a lot of people who were afraid of being incriminated or of incriminating their loved ones. So how were they going to do this? Well, if they could afford it, they went to Switzerland, where, um, helping a, uh, where they had what's called death tourism. You again have to qualify, you have to join an organization, you have to pay quite a lot of money, and you have to be able to get there, you have to do well enough to get there, and then you have to persuade two doctors that you are in fact wanting to die and not for a selfish reason. And you have to be well enough to be able to swallow the potion, which can be very bitter tasting and you have to take various you know, things to keep yourself from vomiting and so on. So there's that way, or there are people who die alone, violently, without their loved ones being around because they're afraid. And I know what I saw in many of these cases in talking to people was a woman I know who's become a friend of, me, of mine now, her husband wanted to die. He had a neurodegenerative disease and what, she loved him. She didn't want him to die. But what she realized was her loss was nothing compared to his suffering. And so she said to me, I let him die because I loved him. But she wasn't there when he did it. There was, now we have a completely different scenario that is possible for patients who qualify, where in fact, the mourning usually takes place before the death. There's no secrecy. In the wake of Sue Rodriguez, palliative care became the acceptable way to help somebody die. And I believe in palliative care. It is patient-centered care. It is you deal with the patient. You try to soothe the patient's fears, anxieties, pain, mostly the pain. But it usually involves the patient being sedated. And for lots of people, that's fine. And I think we all know situations where mom is dying at home and the doctors and nurses say there's an intravenous just keep giving her more morphine as she needs it so really what they're doing is they're they're pumping up the drugs a lot of people don't want that they want control they want to be lucid until the end and the most famous example of that in canada i would say is donald Lowe. he was a microbiologist who was um, you know, in the SARS epidemic in 2003, he was the voice of reason who calmed everybody down and talked about it. He was uh, diagnosed with a mid-stem brain tumor in about 2013. So this is before there is a Supreme Court decision. This is before there's a law. He and his wife, a medical journalist named Maureen Taylor, tried to find a way for him to die the way he wanted to die. They couldn't do it. They investigated all sorts of things. They couldn't go to Switzerland for lots of family reasons. You know, his, his son was, uh, her daughter was getting married. His son was having a baby. It wasn't the right time to. So in the end, he did not have the death he wanted. He had the best palliative care, but he was sedated. She actually said it was like sleeping with a corpse. It was not what he wanted. And so together they made a video about eight days before he died. 
And you know, I don't think that it would have been his decision to make the video because he's a doctor, but she was a journalist, so I think that's what happened. By that point, he couldn't hear her voice, hear anybody's voice but hers. So she asked the questions, and he answered, and he said, I'm not afraid of dying. It's the process. And there he was with one eye taped open, slumped, this incredibly intelligent take charge man, and there he was. And he said, I know there are a lot of clinicians who are opposed to medical assistance in dying, but I'd like them to live in my body for 24 hours and see how they feel. And that was it. It was that he wanted his choice. He didn't want to spend the last moments of his life unconscious, having no control over his bodily functions, not being able to speak to his close family. He wanted to be in control, and basically that's it. Palliative care can take care of most things, but it can't give you control. And that, in fact, is what the story of Sue Rodriguez is all about. Because Sue Rodriguez did have palliative care, and it was good palliative care. And I know because my father-in-law was in the same hospice, and he was treated very well. But that isn't what she wanted. She wanted control, and she was not going to have control with palliative care. Now, Sue Rodriguez had ALS, which is a terrible neurodegenerative disease. It's the same disease that's often called Lou Gehrig's disease. And she became the face of the assisted dying movement in this country. And back in the early 90s, when Sue Rodriguez was about 40, was suffering from ALS, Nobody was publicly asking for the right to die. I mean, there were some doctors who were helping patients along, but it was the doctor's decision. It wasn't the patient's choice. And I think that that's a key issue in this story. Who controls dying, patients or doctors? Sue Rodriguez wanted to control her life and her death. And the problem for Sue Rodriguez was that she could die before she wanted to die, if she was willing to die by her own hand. But if she was going to wait until life was no longer tolerable for her, she was going to be so disabled, she wasn't going to be able to kill herself. She was going to need help. And that's why she went to the Supreme Court of Canada to ask for a medically assisted death. ALS is often um, a disease of last resort in that Doctors are trying to diagnose what is wrong with you. You've got these twitches, you've got maybe some pains, you're, you know, you're stumbling a bit, you're, what is causing this? And they try various solutions or various diagnoses and then finally they say, you know what, I think it's ALS. So it's that kind of disease. It is of an unknown cause but you, and it takes slightly different forms. I mean, Stephen Hawking has ALS. He got it very early when he was a really young man and he has um, a slightly different kind of form. He continues to live, it's like at least 50 years later, but he embraces technology. He is happy hooked up to machinery and having um, computers talk to him. Some people want that, others don't. And it's the kind of disease where in almost every case your brain remains intact because it's the lining of the muscles that, um, that fall apart so that you, you, you no longer have the capacity for your muscle to support your body or your muscles to allow, help you breathe. So it's that kind of problem. So you end up, you can drown in your own phlegm is the expression I hear over and over again. Um, but you, and you can watch your body disintegrating. You can watch that you can no longer talk. Now we have computers that can do a little voice activated and so on, but you watch yourself disintegrate. And for some people, that is a very terrifying thing. So Sue Rodriguez became the voice and the face. She was a very charismatic woman, and she, had, and she was also a very compelling woman. She had a nine-year-old son. Why would she not want to live, to have her son grow up? So she became the voice and the face. And in fact, the last time, I, I have this image in my head all the time, it was she'd lost to the Supreme Court. She was planning her death, although she wasn't saying so. And there was an interview with her on television. And by that time, her voice was so hard to understand that there were subtitles. And all that you were left with was this kind of Jackie Kennedy smile, this beautiful smile. And then she died, and she had the help of a mystery doctor. We still don't know who it was. Her friend, Sven, Rodri uh, Sven, um, her friend, Sven Robinson, was with her, and uh, they, you know, he helped. He gave her the potion. She drank it. 
uh, probably with a glass and a straw because he still won't talk about it. And I've certainly tried to get him to talk about it. And uh, he held her in his arms um, until she died. But her, her little boy was at the movies with his father. You know, they had to come back. That is not the way I want to die. Back in the early 90s, the thing that people did talk about was the sanctity of life. But it was really hard for a lot of us ordinary folk to understand what the sanctity of life meant. I mean, was life always precious? Even when it meant you were on a ventilator or you were in excruciating pain? So that was, that was what we heard all the time. We don't hear that so much now, but there was a young woman in Quebec whose name was Nancy B. And she was, oh, I don't know, 21, 22, and she developed something called Guillain-Barré syndrome, which sometimes you can recover from, but in her case, she couldn't. Three years after diagnosis, she was, I don't know, maybe 25, she couldn't breathe, she was on a ventilator, she was completely paralyzed, and she was just, she had no life. And even though she came from a very strong Catholic family, her family had agreed this was, this was no life for her, and she was going to live for 50 or 60 years in a ventil, you know, it was just intolerable. So she went and she applied to a judge and the judge actually came to her hospital room and saw her and he agreed with her. And so this was the choice she made that she should be able to withdraw from treatment, that she should be able to have the ventilator removed. And so that is one choice. Now, on the other side of the country, Sue Rodriguez was arguing about the same right to determine when her life was no longer tolerable. But she didn't have a ventilator. She hadn't got to that stage. So what she could have done, which would have been perfectly legal, she would have, could have asked for a ventilator, she could have waited, and then she could have said, however she could communicate, is, could you remove my ventilator? But the cruel choice for her was she didn't have a ventilator to, to remove. And you know, I often think that that's what I should have called my book, The History of Cruel Choices. And we need to have empathy for people who are suffering like that. When Sue Rodriguez went to the Supreme Court in 1993, one of the things I find so interesting about that case is it was really the amateur hour. It was, there was like one binder of evidence. And when you compare that with, say, the Carter case 20 years later, there were shelves full of binders of evidence. That's how much the evidence had changed and the number of jurisdictions which had allowed some form of assistance in dying. So for Sue Rodriguez, um, she went before the Supreme Court and she was a very, very compelling figure, but it was one person. And it was one person, it was done very quickly because it was one person who was dying. And we could see her dying before our eyes because she was l rapidly losing the ability. She, when she started that case, she could walk into the courtroom. By the end of it, she couldn't even go to Ottawa. She, had, she couldn't leave BC and she was in a wheelchair and she was hardly intelligible when she spoke. So that's how much changed. But what the decision was made, and she lost very narrowly, which five to four, which to me suggests she was a very compelling witness. She lost because John Sapinka, who, was, who wrote the decision for the majority, argued that the sanctity of life was paramount and it was hard to believe that the courts should allow someone to die instead of by the you know to help a person die rather than to help them live and he said no other jurisdiction allows this but it wasn't exactly true because in the netherlands doctors had been defying the law for quite some time and they had, if they were prosecuted they were not convicted because they argued something complicated called the law the defense of necessity which was yes i have a duty to preserve life but I couldn't let my patient suffer. And I felt it was more important to care for my patient than to follow the law. That basically is what it is. But Sue lost, and that was the reason she lost, that, um, that the court argued that it wasn't up, the, up to the courts to say that, there, that the law should be changed. It was up to Parliament. And there was a feeling among many people that Parliament should have stepped in. And in my view, Parliament has never stepped in willingly. It has always had to be forced by the courts. I think there's a whole history that i am become quite interested in about how does an impossible idea become reasonable? How is it that we have the idea that capital punishment is wrong? How do we say that slavery is wrong? 
or that same-sex marriage should be allowed, or that we should have medical assistance in dying. And there are many factors that are involved in that. And some are legal, some are political, but a lot of it is about reasonableness, making a case, what I call low pulse reasonableness of society changing until it's an acceptable idea in society. And then it becomes something that has to be considered because it's no longer absurd. It is reasonable and then it becomes necessary. And you can see this in, in, in the tipping point by Malcolm Gladwell, you know, well, how does this happen? And it takes a lot of factors that come together. And I think that that is what has happened with uh, assisted dying. I do see the growth of choice under the Charter as an issue of liberty and freedom. I also see it as a responsibility because, I've said this before, you cannot have choice without responsibility. And we can trace that back to a lot of the decisions were made in Charter cases. For example, a woman's right to choose about an abortion. That was a big Charter case. And this is another one. Um, but what is important to remember is um, the abortion decision at the Supreme Court was about a woman's right to choose and a woman's having responsibility over her own body. And it seems to me that there is a link between that decision and the Supreme Court decision. Now, it was lost in 1993 in the Rodriguez decision, but people be still began to think about it. And it was then, it was, char it was asked again 20 years later in Carter. But what the growth of all that means with the Charter is more and more choices. Um, the individual's right to decide everything to do with his or her life. So why is death not part of life? And there was one of the, uh, one of the judges in Rodriguez who made that point very eloquently. And I'm not going to try and, and quote him because he, he made it so eloquently, which is that death is part of life. And if you are entitled as a citizen to make certain decisions about other aspects of your life, why shouldn't you be able to make a decision about death as well? And that's a very strong argument in my point, in my mind. There was a huge sea change between Rodriguez in the early 90s and Carter in, uh, you know, 20 years later. And in the interim, palliative care became a very important means of having, helping people ease into death in Canada and around the world. And one of the things that's really important to remember about palliative care in the evolution of this is palliative care requires talking with your patient. Mm -hmm. So the conversation was beginning to happen. Um, the controls were still very much in the medical hands, they weren't in the patient's hands, but the conversation was beginning to happen. But other things were happening around the world. The Netherlands passed its euthanasia law in 2002. Oregon passed its form of assisted dying in 94, but it really came into being in 97. So there were these things going on in other places, and I could give you other examples as well. But there was a movement in Quebec that was doctor-led. You know, where physician-assisted dying came into, into play was societies that were tolerant, societies that were progressive. And so in Quebec, there was a doctor-led movement, and we cannot forget that Dr. Henry Morgenthaler, who was the man who fought the abortion fight, who was the head of that in, in the focal point of it, he was from Quebec. So doctors in Quebec about 2009 were beginning to ask about how people were dying and how should we be dealing with it. So there was that movement that was, and the argument that healthcare is a provincial matter, therefore we do not have to go to the criminal code and fight this at a federal level. We are in charge of health care, we are Quebec, and it was a conversation with patients and families, and it became something that was introduced into the legislature. At the same time that is happening, on the other side of the country, there is another big legal challenge. And, you know, Joe Arve was the lawyer for the Carter case, and he had seen the Rodriguez case and what had happened and he was thinking about what he would want. It shouldn't just be one litigant, it should be all sorts of people gathered together. And so when, and there was the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association, another heroic organization in my view, because they were willing to take this on. And so they put this case together, but it was more than one person. It was Gloria Taylor who, was, who had ALS. It was uh, 
Hollis uh, Johnson and Lee Carter, who had taken her mother, Kay Carter, to Switzerland to die, and they were worried that maybe they were going to be accused of assisting a suicide. There was a doctor who was willing to say he would help patients die if he wasn't going to lose his license. And so there were a group of people who were there, and there were an incredible number of experts. I think I mentioned before, there were an incredible number of experts. In the Rodriguez case, there was one skinny little binder of evidence. But by Carter, the academics had been writing about this. The academics were getting, one academic in particular, Jocelyn Downey, who was part of the team, she was asking other experts from other parts of the country or other parts of the world, would they testify? She was an expert witness for free. Would they be an expert witness for free? So this pro bono case went through three levels of the court system in British Columbia. And the most extraordinary thing happened when it was at the trial level, they were very lucky in terms of the judge who was there weighing the evidence. Judge Lynn Smith, she tested all these things in court. Her document, her decision is 300 pages long. So all of this, this evidence, the slippery slope, all of these things that people were arguing about, the vulnerable, it was all argued and tested in court. And so not one of those facts was disputed when it went to the Supreme Court. And then the judges one of the judges was the same as in Rodriguez, Beverly McLaughlin, a unanimous decision in February 2015. I'm not a lawyer, but when I think about the Carter decision, I think about a number of extraordinary people who were involved in it, who had learned from what had gone on before, and the evidence was huge. Joe Arve came up with a really interesting argument. And when I interviewed him, he suggested to me, he wasn't sure whether, you know, how did you come up with this idea? And his idea was that the government of Canada was going to be wrapping itself in the sanctity of life argument. And all he was going to be able to say on the other side was liberty and freedom, which is not much compared to the sanctity of life. And then in a flash, and I think these flashes of intuition come after you've spent a lot of time working hard and thinking, and then suddenly, oh yeah, there's the idea. And the idea he came up with was that Gloria Taylor et al. were being denied life because they were being forced to end their lives sooner than they should have. So they were being denied their own lives, the freedom to live their own lives as long as they wanted. And that was a very persuasive argument. But there was this whole other side, which was the evidentiary argument. There was so much evidence. And Lynn Smith, nobody knew who was going to be the judge. It's kind of a little bit of a lottery. And when I was writing my book, I asked both Jocelyn Downey, the academic at Halva in Halifax at Dalhousie, and I asked Joe Arbe, how did you get that judge? How did this work? What did you think? And neither one of them knew her, or knew, I mean, they knew of her, of course, but knew what to expect from her. No one expected that she was going to sift all of that testimony and produce a 300-page document. It is, it is an extraordinary thing. I am sure it should be examined and taught in law schools as, and what she did also, which was really interesting, usually what happens in a, in a lawsuit or in a case is that the decision is at the bottom, whereas 300 pages, you know, she put the decision at the top. Right. So they knew as soon as they read it that, you know, and not one of those facts was ever disputed. So the argument that went to the Supreme Court, one of the arguments was, does a provincial court judge have the right to knock down a Supreme Court decision? And that was one of the arguments that Canada said, that they had no right, she had no right to say this law was unconstitutional. But in fact, when there is new law, when there is new evidence, you do have the right to say that, argued the Supreme Court of Canada. And I think that is why she was so exhaustive in her reasonings. She wanted to lay it all out to so, show that we could, exactly how she reached her decision so that she would be able to establish that yes, the law can be challenged at a provincial level, when the law is an error. I'm a journalist, so I can get interested in a topic and I do a lot of research and I love doing research, but I have to get to people and they have to talk to me and I have to tell stories because otherwise, why would anybody read what I'm writing? I mean, so I need to do this. So I was in Victoria in 2015 
and I was really doing a cold case on the Rodriguez case. I was trying to, you know, talk to all, a lot of the people who were involved there. And I had booked an appointment with Joe Arve, who was the lawyer in the Carter case. I think we had corresponded a little bit, and we knew somebody in common. The way you try and make your connections. And um, so there we were. It was the last week of January, it was early February, and I was interviewing him, and he was like a cat in a hot tin roof, or I don't know, he was just really nervous. And it was because he was concerned, like, who, how was this going to go? He was trying to decide which judges were going to be for, which judges were going to be against, and he didn't think it was going to happen this fast. He thought it was going to take months, it was going to be March or April, and in fact, uh, it was like the next day. And it was like somebody trying to look for the ace of spades. You know, he was looking for the fifth judge. He thought he would have, uh, I don't know, Beverly McLaughlin would be on side, but he wasn't sure about the others. And it was really interesting to watch him because, um, well, it was very dramatic. And then what happened? And then what happened was it was unanimous. It was so eloquent. It was elegant. And it talked about suffering. And I, that's what it was all about, cruel choices and suffering. It wasn't about dying, because we know what's going to happen with dying. It was about suffering and it was about choice. And it was about reconciling the charter rights of doctors and patients. And the judgment also said that it was up to Parliament. If Parliament so too chose to make a new law, it wasn't up to the courts, but all of those things were expressed very quickly. Not one argument about Lynn, Lynn Smith's decisions and whether she'd made any errors of law. I was very disappointed with the medical assistance and dying law. There were a couple of major things that upset me about it. Um, and I had watched the hearings. I had listened to the arguments. I had been very impressed by some people, not so impressed by others. But one of the, the first thing that I noticed was they did not embed medical assistance in dying within palliative care. They'd had two committees who had recommended that it should be embedded in palliative care because medical assistance in dying should be another end of life choice. Frankly, if I had a diagnosis, I would be asking for palliative care consult right away. I want patient-centered care. So that was the first thing. They were not seeing it as part of palliative care. Second, the emphasis had switched from what the Supreme Court was saying, which was about suffering, suffering that is intolerable to the patient, suffering that is grievous and irremediable. It had changed from that to a reasonably foreseeable natural death. So it had gone from suffering to dying, and it also had to mean an incredible uh, decline in, in capacity, all sorts of things, end of life care, which was what it was. So what was going to happen to the people with, say, multiple sclerosis or other neurodegenerative diseases who knew they were going to be suffering for 20 or 30 years. What was going to happen to those people? I found that callous. I thought it was much more concerned with being politically expedient and with protecting the vulnerable. And I was insulted by the argument about protecting the vulnerable because, to me, and I had talked with a lot of people who are disabled, physically disabled, mentally disabled, but there's a difference between the argument that they should be respected in all their humanity and the argument that they can't be, uh, they cannot be respected in to make their own decisions, that they can't be allowed to decide when enough is enough in terms of suffering. So I was upset with that. And there were various other things. There were people who were left out. There were um, mature minors who are terminally ill. So anybody who's ever been around a child with a terminal illness, we know that child is not that, a chronological age. That child is so much older because of what that child has experienced and so on. And we know that there are parents who will do anything to keep their children alive, no matter the torture that children are going through. So to not allow a mature minor to be able to discuss this and make a decision was, I thought, very hard. Advanced directives for patients with dementia after diagnosis. You know, we all say, oh, if I get dementia, you know, just let me float out to wherever. That's fantasy. Once you have a diagnosis, while you are still competent, that is when you should be able to express some wishes about what you want. It means you have to begin the conversation with your doctor. 
it means that you have to say at what point. Now, you may change your mind. You may say, oh, diapers, but you know, we get used to diapers. When I can't recognize my family, when I can't feed myself, those are legitimate things that we should be allowed to say. So that was another thing that upset me very, well, upset me, you know, I thought was wrong. And finally, mental illness. I had struggled with the whole issue of mental illness when I was writing this book. I've never had to cope with somebody with mental illness in my immediate family or circle. I'm not proud of that. It just happened to be a fact. So I didn't know enough, but I learned a lot. And some of it came from reading fiction, reading Miriam Taves's book, um, you know, Puny Sorrows. What is the lesser harm if you have somebody with intractable depression and that person has been through many, many times kinds of treatment, that person has tried to kill himself or herself several times, what is the lesser harm? Is it to let, as in the case of Miriam Taves's father and sister, they go to the railroad tracks and kneel down? Or is it, let me help you? So those are decisions that I think the government of Canada ducked. I was very proud of the Senate. I thought that they argued very forcibly and very um, poignantly and, and persuasively. But in the end, I think they felt they had to bow to Parliament. And so we are still fighting those battles. I've just written um, the paperback version of my book, so I've added another chapter about the law. And I've written about quite a few of the constitutional challenges that I think will be fought. One of them being the reasonably foreseeable death, which actually there was a lawsuit filed right after uh, the law was passed. There's another one. Why are publicly funded hospitals allowed to refuse to offer medical assistance in dying on their premises? That is another challenge. But these challenges take a very long time. It took five years for the Carter case to wend its way through the, the judicial system. These are going to take a long time. I'm hoping that what's going to happen is that some of these things are going to be resolved by doctors in conversation with their patients in terms of how do, we, how do we make this law work? So some people are talking about reasonably predictable death rather than, because of course, reasonably foreseeable, what does that mean? I mean, it's not, you know, nobody can predict, you know, so, so that this person is just, I'm gonna start that again. Um, some of these things are going to be worked out in the interim on the ground. And I think that that's something where we should look to the Netherlands. The Netherlands had 30 years of on the ground practice where doctors were helping patients die, not all doctors, but some doctors, and they were confessing. And they were being charged, but they weren't being convicted because they were arguing the law of necessity. I, I have a right, I have the duty to protect my patient, but I also couldn't let my patient suffer. So all of that was on the ground before the Netherlands passed its law in 2002. We did it the other way around. Mm -hmm. We passed the law without any on the ground practice. So we have to figure out how to make this law work. And we have a complicated system. We have the federal law, but we have the provincial regulations. And you know, it changes across the country. So it's very complicated. So I think that it's, it's really hard for doctors and medical people generally to try and, how am I going to do this? This is the thing I've promised myself I'd never do. It's been against all my training. But I think they are beginning to become more open-minded about medical assistance and dying, more open-minded about what patient-centered care actually means. And so I think there will be some movement on the ground while we wait for constitutional challenges. And of course, all of these constitutional challenges are pro bono, and they're fought by the government lawyers and we pay for the government lawyers. So I find that a difficult situation, but um, I think that justice and choice will prevail eventually. The strangest thing happened to me when I was writing this book. I kept thinking about my mother. And you know, I would long since resolved my mother's death. I mean, she does come back to me lots of times because we had a pretty tempestuous relationship. I think I probably do with my own daughter. And I, you know, I was, the summer I was thinking about one of the things my mother used to say <laughs> at a cottage, 
you call this a holiday? This isn't a holiday. This is nothing but a change of sinks. So that was my mother. So I shriek this every summer, just, you know, general principles. So, and she was sick for a very long time. And she had, she fought cancer for 11 years. And fought is the word for her. No one was allowed to know. This was a big secret. It was, Terry Fox hadn't brought cancer out of the closet yet. So it was, we were all ready for an end to her suffering by the time she finally died. But now I think back and I think to the last nine weeks of her life where she was in a hospital bed and I remember that we'd visit, we could hear the dementia, the patient with dementia screaming orderly, orderly from across the hall. It went on. She couldn't speak anymore. The cancer was in her brain stem. She was suffering. And the logistics of just getting there, the logistics of knowing when she might be dying, when should we get the babysitter so I could go to Montreal to be there. My English sister couldn't come at all. And it was just, now I think, why didn't we ever talk about it? We never did. It was as though if we didn't, if we talked about it, it would be real. And we were pretending, I suppose, that she was going to get better, that one more round of chemotherapy. None of this was going to work. And maybe she wanted to tell us stuff. Maybe she wanted to talk to us about what she wanted for her children. We just, it was, she was ferocious. It was not talked about. And now I feel humbled by that, but I regret it. And I hope that that doesn't happen to other people. I mean, it wasn't a terrible death. It wasn't a terrible death by the, the deaths I've heard about. But I think we could have done it much better. And I think, I don't know what she would have wanted if I were able to talk to her about it today. But I don't think she would have wanted to be alone and scared and not able to talk about it with us.